The goal of this video is to talk about modular arithmetic. That is, given the set Z mod N, so this is the set of equivalence classes modulo N, I'd like to define addition and multiplication I'd like in a well-defined way. So I'd like to talk about what it means to add two equivalence classes and to multiply two equivalence classes in a way that makes sense or in a way that is consistent. So just a quick reminder that the equivalence class of A for any integer, A and Z, is just all the integers b that are congruent to a modulo n. And last time we proved a few properties. We showed that the two equivalence classes, the equivalence class of a and the equivalence class of b are equal if and only if a is congruent to b modulo n. We showed that a is not congruent to b modulo n if and only if the two equivalence classes are disjoint. And we showed that the equivalence class of a is equal to the equivalence class of r if r is the remainder when we divide a by n. So any number is in some sense being set, e set as equivalent to its remainder modulo n. Okay, so let's just do a few reminder examples. So let's look at the case of n is e equal to 7. So we can talk about equivalence classes here. For example, I can talk about the equivalence class of 3. This is going to be the same as the equivalence class of negative 4 which is the same as the equivalence class of 10. So in some sense, we're setting 3, negative 4, and 10 equal to one another. That's kind of the intuition to have here. Well, why is this true? Well, using our properties above, we know that 3 is congruent to negative 4 mod 7. Why is this the case? Well, 7 divides 3 minus negative 4. Right, 7 divides 7. We know that 3 is congruent to 10 mod 7. Why do we know this? Well, 7 divides 3 minus 10. So these, these equivalence classes are all equal to one another. And if we write out the elements, these are all the integers that have a remainder of 3 when they're divided by 7. So the, the elements of the set are 3, 10, 17, 24, so on and so forth. So the thing we can notice here is that we're just kind of starting at 3 and going up by 7. And we can also go down by 7. So 3 minus 7 is negative 4 negative 4 minus 7 is negative 11, and so on and so forth, and we can continue this way. Okay, so these are just some of our equivalence classes. We can also ask, well, what about 6? We'll, we'll use 6 in our examples. Well, the equivalence class of 6, this is going to be the same as the equivalence class of negative 1, which is the same as the equivalence class of negative 8, which is the same as the equivalence class of 13. And we can, we, we can choose infinitely many representatives of either of these sets. So we'll use these in our examples. The key thing here is if I have an equivalence class like 13, and I'd like to write it in terms of a smaller integer, I'm going to ask, what's the remainder when 13 is divided by 7? So in this case, the answer is 6. If I look at negative 8, I want to ask, what's the remainder when negative 8 is divided by 7? The answer here is 1. And again, how do we find these remainders? We either repeatedly add 7s or we repeatedly subtract 7s. So if I started with negative 8, I can add 7, I'd get to negative 1. I could add another 7, I would get to 6. If I have 13, I could subtract the 7 and I would get down to 6. So what we're doing is we're just adding and subtracting 7s uh, in order to get down to our remainder. So we're ready to define and kind of play around with um, arithmetic in Z modulo n. So first we'll give a definition, we'll do a few examples, and then we'll prove that this, these two operations that we define actually work how they're supposed to work. So a natural definition to, to, to use for addition is to say the equivalence class of A plus the equivalence class of B is just the equivalence class of A plus B. And another natural definition to use for multiplication here is to say the equivalence class of A times the equivalence class of B is just the equivalence class of AB. And now we'd like to check, does this operation actually make sense? Because we've already seen that equivalence classes can be represented in infinitely many different ways. So is this dependent on the representation that I choose or is it independent? Ideally, if we want this operation to make sense, we, it should be independent of the representation that I choose. So let's take a look. So we'll start with an with our n equals 7 example. And we see the thing to recall from a little while ago was that we have all these representations of 3 and all these representations of 6. And so what I want to make sure is that if I do something like 3 plus 6, take the equivalence class of 3 plus the equivalence class of 6, that's the same as taking the equivalence class of 10 plus the equivalence class of negative 1. We want to make sure that these give the same answer because these are the same sets. So let's try this out. So 
I'm, I've divided this into two parts. We'll play around with addition on the left-hand side. We'll play around with multiplication on the right-hand side. So the first thing I might say is, okay, well, what is 3 plus 6, the equivalence class of 3, plus the equivalence class of 6? This is going to be, it's the equivalence class of 9. So we're just adding the two, the two numbers. We're adding 3 and 6. And then if I want to simplify this a bit more, I ask, if I'm working in m modulo 7, what's the remainder of 9 when I divide by 7? So this would be 2. So this is the equivalence class 2. So this is our element of z mod n. Okay, so 3 plus 6, great, I get 2. Well, what if I don't want to use 3 and 6? What if instead of 3 I want to use 10, and instead of 6 I want to use negative 1? So let's try that. So we know that the, set, the, the equivalence class of 3 and the equivalence class of 10 are the same, so let's use 10. And the equivalence class of 6 and the equivalence class of negative 1 are the same, so I get 10 plus negative 1. This is the equivalence class of 9. And this gives me 2, All right, just like above. Okay, so so far it doesn't seem like it depends on my choice of representation. I could say, okay, three, the equivalence class of 3 is the same as the equivalence class of negative 4, so let's choose negative 4. And the equivalence class of 6 is the same as the equivalence class of negative 8, so let's choose negative 8. And let's see what we get. We're going to get the equivalence class of negative 12. And now to get to our remainder, we're going to repeatedly add 7s. Right? So if I add 7 the first time, this is the same as the equivalence class of negative 5. And if I add 7 again, we see that this is the equivalence class of 2. So we're always going up by 7 or we're going down by 7 because our example is for n is equal to 7. But what we're seeing here is that no matter which representative I choose, I'm always getting a 2. So this operation seems to be well defined. Now let's play with multiplication a little bit. So for multiplication, let's, let's just use the same numbers. So I can take the equivalence class of 3 times the equivalence class of 6. This is going to be the equivalence class of 3 times 6, which is 18. And now I want to get down to my remainder, so I'm just going to repeatedly subtract 7s. So if I subtract 7, this is the same as the equivalence class of 11. And if I subtract 7 one more time, this is the equivalence class of 4. So I get that the equivalence class of 3 times the equivalence class of 6 is the equivalence class of 4. Remember, we're after our remainder. The remainder of 18 when it's divided by 7 is 4. Okay, so we get 4. Now let's check our other examples. What if instead of 3 I wanted to use 10, and what if instead of 6 I wanted to use negative 1? So let's do the equivalence class of 10 times the equivalence class of negative 1. We're going to get the equivalence class of negative 10. And now we want to get up to our remainder. So if we, if we have a negative number, we want to add 7s. So negative 10 plus 7 is negative 3, and negative 3 plus 7 is 4. Okay, so we get the same result. We get 4. Great. Let's try our last example. Let's try, instead of the equivalence class of 3, we'll use the equivalence class of negative 4. And instead of the equivalence class of 6, we'll use the equivalence class of negative 8. So let's do minus 4 times minus 8. And what is this going to give me? This is going to give me 32. Okay. And now I'm just going to repeatedly subtract 7. So 32 minus 7 is 25. 25 minus 7 is 18. 18 minus 7 is 11, and 11 minus 7 is 4. All right, so I end up with the equivalence class of 4. Okay, so I see that this operation seems to be well-defined as well. Okay, so now let's prove that this works how it's supposed to work. Or rather, let's prove that everything here is well-defined and makes sense. Right? So we see that this is working out in our examples, but we'd like a general proof of this fact. Okay, so now we're ready to prove a theorem. We're going to show that if A and B give the same equivalence class, and C and D give the same equivalence class, then adding the equivalence classes of A and C is the same as adding the equivalence classes of B and D. Similarly, adding the equivalence, uh, multiplying the equivalence classes of A and C is the same as multiplying the equivalence classes of B and D. Okay, before we prove this, we're going to reformulate this because working with equivalence classes, I mean, it's fine, but there's a better way of reformulating this in terms of modular arithmetic. So what we're going to do is we're going to write an equivalent statement. The thing to remember here is that the equivalence class of A is equal to the equivalence class of B if and only if A is congruent to B mod N. We know that the equivalence class of C is, e is equal to the equivalence class of D if and only if C is congruent to D mod N. So showing that these two sets, that the equivalence class of A plus C is 
equal to the equivalence class of b plus d is equivalent to showing that a plus c is congruent to b plus d mod n. And similarly for multiplication, showing that these two equivalence classes are equal is the same as showing that a c is congruent to b d mod n. So let's, let's prove the statement on the right hand side, it's an equivalent statement. So let's begin our proof. So I'll write, suppose that a is congruent to b mod n and c is congruent to d mod n. So let's unravel these definitions a little bit. Well, I can say then n divides a minus b and n divides c minus d. Okay, well what does this tell us? I can say then there exists integers j and k and z such that a minus b is equal to nj and c minus d is equal to nk. Okay, so we'd like to say something about a plus c minus b plus d. So we'd ideally like a plus c minus b minus d to appear. And one thing we, we can notice is that if I add these two, I'll get exactly that expression. So let's add these two expressions first. So I could say first, a minus b plus c minus d is equal to nj plus nk. Okay, well, let's, let's rewrite this a little bit. I could write this as a plus c minus, in parentheses, b plus d is equal to n times j plus k. Okay, well, what does this tell me? This tells me that n divides a plus c minus b plus d. And by definition, this just means that a plus c is congruent to b plus d mod n. Okay, so I've proved that addition is well defined. I've proved the statement for addition. Now let's prove the statement for multiplication. So I'll write second. What I'd like to show if I look at the statement for multiplication is that AC minus BD is divisible by N. So I'm going to be a little bit clever here. I'm going to write, okay, AC minus BD. And now I'm going to add a zero to the middle. So I'll write this as AC minus BC plus BC minus bd. So all I've done is I've added zero to the middle here. Minus bc plus bc is zero. Let's see where that gets us. Well, this can be written now as a minus b times c plus b times c minus d. And let's use our information up here that a minus b is nj and c minus d is nk. So what does this give me? This gives me njc plus b times nk. And I see that I could write this now as n times jc plus bk. And so n divides ac minus bd. Hence, I have that ac is congruent to bd mod n. And I've proved my theorem. Okay, so let's do a few more examples. Okay, so now we're ready to explore an example, and we'll do a few more examples in upcoming videos as we explore the properties of z mod n. Okay, so one thing I'll point out is that oftentimes I'll just write a instead of the equivalence class of a when the context is clear. So when it's clear that we're working with equivalence classes, we'll omit these brackets, and the reason is that the brackets get a bit cumbersome to write. So for example, when I write z mod 4, I'm just going to write the numbers 0, 1, 2, and 3, without the brackets. And these, these numbers represent equivalence classes. But let's kind of think about how arithmetic works here. Well, we know that the equivalence class of, so, so let's, let's fill in our multiplication table. We know that the equivalence class of 0 plus 0 is going to be 0. The equivalence class of 0 plus 1 is going to be 1. And similarly for this top row. Okay, so this is not that interesting. Similarly, if I go down uh, this column here, I'll see that 1 plus 0 is the same as 1. 2 plus 0 is the same as the equivalence class of 2, and 3 plus 0 is the same as the equivalence class of 3. Okay, not too interesting. So, so far, our operations are not interesting. Let's fill in these guys. So this is where, where the interesting stuff starts to happen. We know that 1 plus 1 is 2. That's still one of the numbers in my set. We know that 1 plus 2 is 3. And something interesting happens when I do 1 plus 3. When I do 1 plus 3, I should get 4. But the equivalence class of 4 is the same as the equivalence class of 0 when we're working modulo 4. So we'll write that 1 plus 3 is equal to 0. So the thing to note here is that 1 plus 3 is equal to 4, which is the same as 0. So now we're just taking remainders. If we get a number that's 4 or larger, we're going to ask, what is its remainder modulo 4? 
and reduce it down to that remainder. So similarly in the next row, I can do two plus one, I'll get three, that's fine. That's one of the numbers in my set. But if I do two plus two, I'll get four and four is zero. So in our set here, we have that two plus two is equal to zero. If I do two plus three, the next entry, I'll get that this is five, but five when I divide it by four has a remainder of one. So we have an operation where two plus three is equal to one. Okay, and then similarly down below, 3 plus 1 is equal to 4, which is the same as 0. 3 plus 2 is 5, which is the same as 1. And 3 plus 3 is 6, which is the same as 2. So this is what our addition table looks like. For our multiplication table, we're going to do something similar. We'll notice that the first row up here and the first column here are very easy to fill in because zero times any number is just zero. So zero times zero is zero, zero times one is zero, zero times two is zero, zero times three is zero, so on and so forth. So these guys can be filled in with zeros. Another thing we might notice is that, well, one times any number is just that same number. So if these, these entries are gonna be very easy to fill in. So one times one is one, one times two is two, one times three is three, uh, two times one is two, three times one is three. Okay, so those are, those are pretty straightforward to fill in. The remaining four are going to be the interesting ones. So let's do two times two. Let's fill in this entry. And what do we get for two times two? We're going to get two times two. This is equal to four, but this is the equivalence class of zero. So we have that two times two is equal to zero. And finally, we can fill in this entry. If we do two times three, that's six. So two times three is equal to six. But the equivalence class of six is the same as the equivalence class of two. So we just take the remainder of six when dividing by four. So we get two over here. Okay. Um, this next entry here is going to be pretty similar, right? That's just three times two. Three times two is also six, which we know is two. So we could fill this in. And then finally, we have this last entry over here. So three times three is nine. Nine modulo four. If we want, we could repeatedly subtract four. So nine is the same as five, which is the same as one. So we're going to put a one here. And remember, our goal is to always get a number in this set. So we always want to reduce everything down to its remainder. Okay, so we'll stop with this example. And in the next video, we'll explore some properties of Z mod N.